and that you're ready to learn some more and then there will be time to continue with the labs after that. Welcome also to those joining us on Twitch. So I realized earlier on I was a little rude. I didn't actually introduce myself properly. Uh, so my name is Gareth Eager and I'm a solution architect uh, with AWS. Um, I work with some of our enterprise customers in the New York City region uh, to help them understand AWS services, how they can use them uh, together to architect solutions uh, for their business. Um, and so my, my job is pretty much keeping up with uh, the innovation and the um, constant developments in AWS. In this session, we're going to look at processing and analyzing your data um, in the data lake. So we know that data is changing. You've probably seen 100 presentations already that tell you this. So this is probably not new and shocking news to you. Data is changing, and as a result, analytics are changing. You know, um, perhaps 10 years ago or so, the data sets and the way of analyzing your data was very different. There were a lot of batch jobs. There was no real rush, like, we'll take today's data. Tonight, we'll run it overnight. We'll have some figures in the morning. Um, everything was batch. There is still a lot of batch, but as things accelerate, as data accelerates, there is this um, requirement from businesses to stay competitive and to work more towards the use of streaming data. And there's all different types of data sets now. Uh, you know, traditionally, it was a lot of database and there were maybe some Excel spreadsheets. Um, today, businesses are dealing and they're wanting to be able to better analyze all types of different data. So that could be um, a realty company who wants to be able to take all the photos that the realtors are taking um, of properties for sale, and they want to analyze and automatically extract information out of that. That's data, and that's new types of data that need new types of um, analysis. And so the AWS Data Lake, as you've been learning today, helps to address this. Uh, firstly, it enables you to very quickly ingest and store any type of data. So you can bring your photos in, you can bring in your call center um, audio transcripts, you can bring in your Excel files and your JSON files, and uh, all different types of data, structured and unstructured, can be very quickly ingested with uh, various tools in AWS um, into the data lake. And then you've got this wide variety of tools that you can use so that you can pick the right tool for the right job um, to optimize your analytics. And, and we're going to be looking at that today. And then we also provide a bunch of services and tools to help you balance um, getting insights from your data, democratizing your data, and making it available to a wider audience within your corporation, but balancing that again, still keeping the data secure still um, auditing the, the data usage and making sure that you have good data governance in place. So the analytics portfolio or the data lake um, ecosystem um, around S3 is, is really extensive as this slide shows. Um, and this slide shows a lot of common use cases uh, that apply for the data lake. So on the right-hand side, you've got analytics, and there's all different types of analytics from interactive to Hadoop to data warehousing. And then more and more, we're hearing about um, machine learning use cases. And they're all different types of, again, machine learning use cases from building customized models for an organization from data that you've trained yourself to using services in AWS like AWS recognition, that is a pre-built and trained model that can extract metadata out of an image to tell you if the person in the image is smiling, if they're wearing sunglasses, um, whether they seem to be happy or sad or angry. And so you have all these use cases, and within AWS, you have all these tools um, to, to help you deal with these use cases. And so the, the tools that we develop, we integrate with S3 uh, because that really becomes the heart of, of your data lake. So we spoke a little bit about this, but not in too much detail earlier on in, in the previous presentation. Um, but it's great that you've got all this raw data and you can easily ingest it into your data lake. But 
what can happen, though, is you can ultimately end up with a data swamp. If all you do is ingest your data and then think it's going to be useful to people, you're going to end up with a data swamp. And a data swamp is an area where you've got a lot of data, but nobody's really sure what's there. They, they don't know how to find the data that they're looking for and that applies to them. And then even if they do find that data, they're kind of unsure about where it came from and how it got there, and, and can they trust it, and is it recent, and is it optimized? And so building a data lake is more than just ingesting raw data. You need to do um, a couple of core things, and, and we're going to look at a few of them here. Um, most importantly is catalog the data so that you, you have more metadata about what's in your data lake and make this a searchable catalog so that the data consumers in your organization can find the data that they need and understand more about the sources of that data. And then you also want to optimize the data for analytics. It's great. You can ingest all these JSON files and CSV files, and you can ingest um, hundreds of gigabytes. You can ingest hundreds of terabytes. Uh, but those files are not really optimized for running large-scale queries against. And so you need to do some work to compress the files um, and to put them into a format that is better suited for analytics. And then you also want to partition your data. And we're going to look and explain a little bit about how you approach that and, and what the benefits are. And then you also want to look at denormalizing or flattening your data. So this is where you may join a number of tables together. Um, kind of the opposite of when, when you're going to uh, a traditional relational database, you're generally normalizing the data. You want kind of one copy of any one entity or entry, and you have that linked to a bunch of other tables through foreign keys. Um, with data analytics, you often end up denormalizing the data or, or flattening it. And as you've heard today, and as you've seen um, when you've been doing the labs, that um, AWS Glue is a service that helps you both with the data cataloging and then with developing and running your ETL jobs. So the crawlers go out and discover your data and discover information about the partitions and the schema. And then you're able to run ETL jobs um, <clears throat> to, to do things like uh, convert the format of the file to compress it, partition it, um, and denormalize or flatten it, or various other things that you may want to do, um, such as aggregating data and, and working out averages. So as I mentioned, text files are not optimized for um, analytics. Text files are great if you're the one doing the analysts uh, or the analytics, um, and you need a, uh, to be able to read the file. A text file you can open up in your favorite text editor. Um, but it, that's probably not a really scalable approach to, to doing big data analytics. So with big data analytics, you want machines to do the analytics for you. And the machines are much better at working with compressed files. Um, and so over the last uh, few years, what has become really popular is these new file formats. Really popular ones are Parquet and ORC. And these formats are, um, by default, they're compressed. They're in a binary format. So you're not going to be able to open them with your uh, favorite text editor. But the analytics uh, software and tools that you use will be able to very effectively work with them. And one of the reasons is um, analytics often is favors uh, or often works more with columns than rows of data. So let's say you get into tonight's sales data from around the country and you've got gigabytes of data, and there's a column there that talks about um, the, the total price of every transaction. Very often in analytics, you're going to be wanting to do something with that, whether it's summing it up or whether it's um, working out uh, uh, averages or doing some other kind of statistics on that. And so these file formats are really structured around working with columns. And the way that they're physically written to disk even um, is all about to optimize running uh, or, or reading them um, on, on a column base. These files also include integrated um, indexes and stats. So you can imagine your sales data, once you convert it to Parquet, for example, you may end up with thousands and thousands of these Parquet files that you now want to run your analytics against. And then in each file, because it's keeping stats, it can do things like track, what is the minimum value of a column? 
And what is the maximum value? So let's say uh, for one specific file, the minimum value is $53 for this one column, and the maximum value is $864. If you want to do a query where you're saying, I want to know of all sales over $1,000, your analytics engine can read this metadata or the statistics about the file, and it immediately knows there is no transactions in their file that are over um, $1,000. And so it doesn't need to scan all the details of their file to figure it out. The metadata tells it that, and it can move on to the next file. So this is why um, these formats are really optimized for the type of um, analytics that we need to run today. There, there is another type that's optimized in a similar way, but it's row-based. Um, so if you're doing uh, reads where you're reading a subset of rows, but you're reading all the columns, then this uh, Avro is a good format for that. And that also is compressed. It's in a binary format. It also includes stats and indexes. <clears throat> but, but that's for where you're reading um, a subset of rows, um, but all columns. A lot of what we're going to be talking about today and a lot of what we do in analytics is really focused on the columns. The other way that you can optimize uh, your analytics is through data partitioning. And this is where you separate your data files by any column, by any column of your choice. And then when your analytic engine runs, it only has to um, read the partitions where, where there is relevant data based on, for example, the where clause in your SQL statement. And what this does is, similar to using Parquet files, um, in addition to that, it helps you to um, reduce the amount of data that needs to be scanned, and that leads to increased performance. And then if you remember Athena and uh, services like Redshift Spectrum, the pricing is based on the amount of data scanned, so $5 to scan a terabyte of data. If you can reduce the amount of data that needs to be scanned, you can significantly reduce the cost of your queries. And so we'll actually have a look at um, some examples of that in a moment. So when you're partitioning, a very common way to do the partitioning is based on a date. So it could be something kind of simple like this. You have flight data and you break it up into um, different years. And so if you looked at this, in S3, if you'd used something like Spark, and you'd said to Spark, I've got all this data, I want to write it to S3, and I want to partition it by the column year, you would look and you would see a structure something like this. And, and you may have noticed that in the labs that you were doing. And so when you now run a query that says, select the destination or origin from flights where the year equals 1991, the analytics engine only has to look at that one prefix or, or directory, you could think of it that way, um, containing files for the year equals 1991. And in, in a similar way, you, in, another common pattern is to uh, get a little more um, granular with it, where you're now uh, doing your partitioning in multiple levels, so by year, by month, and by day. And so if you know that a lot of your queries are going to be querying one specific day or a few specific days, then doing your partitioning like this um, is, is beneficial. You now don't even have to read through all the files for an entire year. You can go and find the files um, for a specific day. So a few guidelines here when choosing a column that you want to partition your data on. Um, and really the, the first rule here is that it should be a column with relatively low cardinality. And that's uniqueness throughout um, the data set and yet also with a pretty even distribution of data for that um, column or key. So again, if we're looking at the date format, um, it, let's say we, uh, we did go by year, a month and day. You know, if you've got sales data for a year and you're open every day of the year, you're going to have a good, pretty equal mix um, of data in each one of those partitions. So you're doing it by day, month, and year, you'll have 365 partitions per year. That's not a problem at all. You can have data for 10 or 20 years like that. Um, but if you get a bunch of IoT data in and you're getting a lot of data per second and you think, well, maybe we partition by second, that would be going to a, an extreme where you're probably going to start running into performance problems because you will literally have millions of partitions for a year.
projected. Did, so let me repeat the question quick. Yeah, so this is for, for batch processing. You're ingesting all this data. You're doing some processing to partition it out. Um, and, you're anal and you're optimizing your analytics by doing that. Um, and the question was, how about when you've got real-time streaming um, data come in, how, how do you partition or optimize your analytics there? So typically you would land your data as it comes into some S3 bucket and then you'd run a separate job to read that data, do compaction, which is combining of, you know, if you have a lot of small files into reasonably sized files, you'd repartition that data um, because, you know, you might be getting data in a certain way that's on the receive timestamp, but you, it might be queried in a different way. Uh, so you want to partition it based on the query keys. Right, so I mean typically we see customers doing micro batching okay. and you can run things um, triggered by either a lambda function and you could pick up a certain set of uh, files. How often, as in, like, how, how many times in a day, or? Yeah, in generally, what is the pattern like? So typically, you want to have enough data to make sure you have good size compaction, like, uh, which is like 256 MB to about a gig file, a single size file. That's the range of data size that's recommended. Uh, so it really depends on how much data you're getting and, you know, what is the lag that you're okay with on the querying side. So if you want, as he was mentioning, like, you know, near real time, availability of the newest data, then you want to run that, you know, pretty much every minute or, you know, even less than that. Yeah, so it depends on how much data you're getting at what rate and then, you know, uh, how quickly you want to access that data and you just need to kind of figure out a good balance there. Um, if you truly need data, if you're truly needing data in near real time, um, then you're probably going to live with that performance hit essentially on the querying side. Uh, the recommendation for most optimal querying is that size. So uh, you probably want to see if you are okay with slightly stale data. Like if you're not getting enough data in a minute, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes is a good window to. Uh, I'm not, so, do you know what Yeah, so uh, just to make sure I understand the question, you were asking, do we have customers who are streaming data into Redshift? So uh, we do have customers who will use tools like Kinesis Firehose, where they take streaming data and then they batch it, and, and one of the functions of Kinesis Firehose is to load that into targets like Redshift. So doing inserts into Redshift is a relatively expensive operation. Um, so you've got to play around with the buffering to make sure you're getting the right intervals or the right data sizes. Uh, but yeah, uh, Amazon Kinesis Firehose is a tool that can help to load your streaming data directly into Redshift. But that also copies it on S3 and then from S3 copies it Yeah, so behind the scenes it's, it's putting it into S3 and then it's from S3 it's doing a, a load into Redshift. The, the reason for that is because Redshift is optimized to read from S3, it actually paralyzes the read. So the recommendation is to put data in some temporary storage in S3 and then load it to Redshift. All right. So to continue, um, some guidelines here. Uh, sorry, if we can, is it a partitioning question? Because otherwise I'd rather, okay, let's go for it. Sorry, when you're talking about the date? So, I mean, you can, you can partition by, by any column. Um, so you, you can partition by, by date and year. So, and actually, I'll, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of, of how that structure would, would look in a moment. Um, but I'll, the, the next point here was actually to say that um, you can use strings as well. It doesn't have to be date in your partitions. 
So for example, if you know that you're going to be doing queries on a regular basis, taking, let's say, the sales data, and you sometimes want to query that by country, and sometimes by state, and sometimes by the business unit in a state, then the, that would be a pretty good way to partition it. Country slash state slash business unit. If it was rather by business unit, you may want to put it business unit first, and then country and state. Um, and the, the key here really is you do need to give some thought when you're doing your partitioning into how do you want to query your data and what do you want to filter out. So you've got to think when you're writing SQL statements, what are you likely to be putting with the where clause? And then you want to optimize your partitioning around that. So we had the slide up um, earlier in, in a previous presentation, but what this shows is all your data sources coming into S3, and their first bucket is your raw data. You catalog that with glue um, so that we can now have our uh, other tools like Glue ETL or EMR or Athena work with that uh, data. And then you run a Glue ETL process, and maybe in the first stage, you're just saying, I'm going to transform this file um, into Parquet format, and I'm going to partition it by a specific year. And so then you end, that, end up with that being in maybe a separate bucket or a separate prefix w within your S3 bucket. You run your Glue jobs again to now go and catalog the transformed data. And then there may even be a third phase in your data lake where you're saying, OK, now I want to do some uh, denormalizing. I want to do some enrichment of the data I have and join various tables. And so there may be multiple phases um, to your uh, pipeline for preparing your data uh, for wider analytics uh, within your corporation. And ultimately, though, you're going to get to the point where you feel that you've optimized your data for querying. And now you have some choices about what tools you want to use to query that data. So we're going to look at a couple of them today. Amazon Athena, Amazon EMR, um, Redshift and Redshift Spectrum. Um, and those are, are kind of analytic engines. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about QuickSight, which is our, our business intelligence visualization tool. So let's start off with talking about Athena. So if you've been doing the labs, you've already used Athena a little bit. Um, and so you would have realized Athena enables interactive querying of data directly in S3 or in your data lake using standard NC SQL statements. And so your typical users here are data scientists and data analysts, maybe data engineers, who wanting to both maybe initially explore the data that's coming into the data lake and then they want to run SQL analytical queries on the data in the data lake, possibly even using um, Athena and those queries uh, to create new tables um, as, as part of the uh, processing pipeline. The, the great thing about Athena is that, it is that there's no infrastructure for you to set up or manage. So once you have used Glue to go and catalog your data, you can immediately go, for example, to the Athena console, and you can write a SQL query to go and query the data in S3. Uh, you can, of course, also use um, JDBC or ODBC connectors with Athena. So it doesn't have to be through the console. Using those JDBC connectors, you can use various other tools to also do um, SQL analytics on your S3 data. And then, as I mentioned, it's your pain for the amount of data scanned, and that's why the partitioning and the transforming of the files are so important. Um, and, and so you'll be paying $5 per terabyte of data scanned. So let's look at some best practices. And the first of these really tie into what we've been talking about. But it gives you an example of what a difference partitioning can make for your data. So in that first example, we're doing a select count star from our line item table. And we're saying where the ship date equals a specific date, 1996-09-01. So if we run that against a non-partition table, that query in, in this testing that was done would take nearly 10 seconds, 9.71 seconds to run. And it would need to scan the full line item data table, and that's uh, 74 gig. Now, by partitioning that data by year, a month, and date, we're able to reduce the run time down to just over two seconds. And then even more impressively, we're able to reduce the amount of data scanned from 74 gig down to just under 30 megs of data scanned. 
And so you can see we take the cost of the query from 36 cents to scan the 74 gig of data, the cost of the query to well below one cent um, to, to effectively get the same results from your data set. Um, and, and that's some of the power of partitioning. At the same time, it is possible, you know, there's always two sides to everything. You can end up over partitioning your data. Um, and this is again where you need to give some thought into how you're going to, what type of queries you're going to be running on your data. If you are going to be often running um, queries that select all the columns um, for, for your data set, uh, you may actually find that your performance will decrease slightly because um, S3 now has to work through the different partitions of your data. So where um, you're still scanning the same amount of data here, partitioned or unpartitioned if you're doing a select star um, on everything, but the amount of runtime is slightly longer on the partition data uh, because of, of the overhead of, of dealing with the partitions and dealing with every partition, not being able to prune any of them out. So the question was, um, along with the query charges, is there any charge for the cost of compute? And with Athena, there is no charge with cost of compute. It's purely based on the data that you scan for your queries. So that's one of the advantages. If you're not running anything, there's, there's no monthly cost. There's nothing to have it available. Um, you purely pay for when your query runs based on the amount of data scanned. So let's look at some other best practices here. And, and these now really have to do with how you um, format your, your SQL queries. So here we see that um, if you do kind of a traditional SQL query where you're saying, I I'm wanting to get some data from a line item table from the comment field where it includes the words tweets or regular or express and a few others. And you do that by chaining together a bunch of like statements. Um, that's not a, a, an optimal way with something like an Athena, the Athena Analytics Engine um, to, to run that query. By rather using a regular expression, as in the top example, um, you're able to see a 17% improvement in the performance of that query. To be honest, I didn't uh, do this one, so I'm going to give you a link, though, to the blog post where it actually has some of these best practices and more, um, and some of the data may be there. I'm not sure. To see this consistency, typically how many queries of the same type do you have to run? Like this? You know, I, I think it really does depend um, ultimately on your data set. Every, this was a sample, um, so it, it depends on perhaps how wide the columns are, how big the data set is, how many like statements you're chaining together. But the, the idea here, though, is regular expressions are going to be more performant with something like Athena, where, where we can optimize around that better than we can with chaining like statements. And the cost of these two would be the same, though? Yeah, the cost of these two would be the same. We'd still scan the same amount of data. Um, so the cost would be the same, but you'd have a performance improvement uh, with the one. And, and here's another really important um, tip, because when you're doing analytics, you're going to quite often end up joining tables together. And this is, seems like a really small thing, but it makes a really big difference. When you're doing a join, you want the larger table on the left-hand side of your query and the smaller table on the right-hand side. And this really just has to do with how, under the covers, the analytic engine works. But over here, we've got tables, a, a parts table, and, and that's a really big table. And then we've got a line item table, and this is from an order. So this is uh, a, obviously a much smaller table. And so when we're doing this, this joint here, um, if we put the part table on the left, we see a 53% performance improvement compared to running pretty much exactly the same query, <clears throat> but putting the larger table on the right-hand side. So it's a small thing, but if you have uh, data engineers in your organization that are starting to work with um, Athena and they're new to it. Uh, like I said, there's going to be a, a link to the full blog post um, in one of the slides. But it's important that um, your, your teams become aware of this as it can make a significant um, difference to the performance of the queries. Uh, yeah. It takes to run a query, uh, it's just 
costing you much. So you're not yeah. doing anything on money. No, it's just that exactly. So, so the question is, yeah, do you, do you save any money through these performance things? No, this is generally just about, um, about yeah, and performance. So you want to, if you think that time is money, then maybe you're saving some money, right? But you're not saving any money as far as your Athena costs go. The Athena costs are the same, uh, but you're uh, improving performance, and, and that's what you all want to do. And then this one, as you can see, makes the biggest difference. And you probably would have guessed this now through our discussions about using parquet files because they're column-based files and, and using partitioning to reduce the amount of data scanned. This is just an example where we say we're doing a select star, so we're selecting all the columns in our table. Um, and another example where we're selecting the specific columns that we know we need for our query. And the query is 145 times faster. So again, this, this kind of means you, you need to encourage your data engineers basically not to be lazy. Don't do select star. It, it may be tempting, it, it may be easier, um, but don't do select star. When, when, especially when you're writing these for uh, production and you, you've got these big ETL jobs that are running, um, make sure that you really put thought into your queries um, because they are little optimizations that can make a significant difference to the performance. I have one quick question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the question is, as the schema changes, and that's pretty common um, in your data lake, you may find the schema changes. If you're doing a select on specific columns, um, there's perhaps a, a bigger chance that your, your query is going to fail if, if a column goes away. And, and I think you're, you're totally right there. And so like everything, you need to balance these things out. And, and every organization and, and perhaps every table, every query, you may decide on different trade-offs here. So, Um, I'm not sure if projectors, does it use a null, does it assume a null value if a column goes away uh, suddenly when Athena's, do you know, when Athena's trying to read if the column's not there? I'm not quite sure. We'll need okay. to check on that. Oh, you yeah. do? Yeah. Okay. Where the column names get deprecated from the APIs and then it shows up as null. If those columns are involved, I'm not sure about Athena, but I'm talking well, about press. Oh, yeah. oh. Not in the web, in the select. Okay. So yeah, in, in our example, we were using those, uh, well, those were in the select, but if they were in the where clause, um, it could fail. And you know, this is generally, I think, as somebody, if you're in IT, if you're in data, you realize that there are trade-offs with a lot of the decisions that you make. And so sometimes you need to put a lot of um, thought into it, and, and sometimes you need to decide to change strategy. Uh, it really depends to you if a, a, uh, if you don't have a good way to track schema changes, and early on we spoke about how you can get Glue to notify you of those changes through CloudWatch integration, um, but if you don't feel that you can adequately do that and it's critical to you if a job fails, maybe you make a trade-off um, and take a performance hit um, in exchange for the stability. Um, but if you put in the right procedures in place, you're getting those notifications from Glue when the schema changes, and you're proactively dealing with it, um, you can certainly get significant performance improvements by being more selective um, in how you write your queries. Yeah? Can you index partitions? Um, so I don't believe you can index partitions directly, but with the, the file formats like Parquet, they've got indexing as part of the, the format of the file. So it's not really the, the partition that's indexed, but there is kind of this concept of indexing and sorting with, within the files still. Sorry, uh, do, do we recommend what? So, so is the question whether you should do a continuous crawling or? Yeah. So crawlers right now run on a schedule, and you need to kind of give it the S3 buckets or paths which you want to crawl. So it is really, um, 
I, I mean, it's not that it'll crawl everything in S3 for you. Uh, so you need to kind of give it enough data to know which buckets to crawl and give it the right IAM credentials to go and access that data. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, I don't know if data really changes from a schema perspective that often. Typically, what, what we see is new partitions getting registered in the catalog, and crawlers can do that as well. Um, and crawlers will only look at incremental or new data. So if you have no data that has been written, then the crawler, it'll be a no-op for the crawlers. That being said, I mean, depending on how often you're getting updates to your data, if it's, if it's like streaming updates, then maybe you can run it every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes if it is a batch update then an hourly crawling usually is okay. So it depends on, on that. Uh, just to follow up, uh, so does the crawler actually keep query jobs waiting? No. no. There's no coupling between the crawlers or the query jobs as such. So yeah, the question there was does the crawler keep query jobs uh, waiting? But yeah, they're, they're decoupled effectively. So what the crawler does, it updates the catalog um, Athena's not going to wait for those updates. Athena uses the catalog as, as it finds it when it's running the query. <clears throat> so moving on to um, Amazon EMR, which is now a different way for analyzing your data. And, and here, typical users are data scientists and data engineers who need to process and analyze really large amounts of data um, using some common open source projects. And that's typically um, Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark. So again, we keep coming back to our data lake. It's built on S3, and it has all this integration to different analytical tools. In this case, with EMR, you get access to 19 open source um, tools. And that is things like for, for batch um, processing, uh, it's tools like Hive and Pig. For interactive processing, um, Spark or Presto. Uh, for machine learning, maybe Spark ML. And so you have this wide variety of tools um, that you can use in a managed cluster with EMR. And so with EMR, we manage the cluster. We um, regularly update the releases or the availability of the latest tools. Generally, within 30 days after they've been released, um, they become available within EMR. Um, and so you using the storage in S3, and so a really important concept here to remember is, and what we keep pushing, is this decoupling of compute and storage. And so traditionally, when you were doing um, Hadoop-based projects, if you were running this on-prem somewhere, um, it wasn't easy to decouple compute and storage. Generally, each compute node or each node within your cluster would have some associated storage with it. If you wanted to increase compute, you had to increase storage, um, and, and the other way around as well. Uh, and then you couldn't shut down the cluster even if things were, were quiet because that was where all the data lived. And so that was where the data was persisted. When you decouple your Hadoop um, processing and the compute from the storage at the S3 layer, um, it enables things like running transient clusters and running multiple clusters to work on the same data sets. So often when you were running Hadoop on-premise, there'd be a bit of a fight between um, the data science and the data engineering teams because everybody had a job that they wanted to run um, at the same time, and uh, the, the server would get busy and, and not be able to um, handle the load always. When you're running it within, with S3 as your persistent storage base, you can now spin up multiple clusters, and so each team can have their own EMR cluster configured with the tools that they want, analyzing and accessing um, the data in S3. And then you can also have transient clusters where you don't have to have the cluster running all the time. You're able to have um, these transient clusters where if you know at uh, every night at 10 o'clock we get all the sales data in and we've got this ETL job that needs to run for three hours or so to process it, you're able to spin up a cluster just to process that and then shut down um, at the end of it. So I see there are a couple of questions, but we've only got 20 minutes left and they're still, we're only about halfway through. So um, we will save questions for the end, and if we don't get to it at the end, absolutely come and, and speak to us as well. So an example of somebody who's using EMR with a, a S3-based data lake um, is Zillow. I'm sure a lot of you will know Zillow and, and the app. 
Um, they operate a, um, a portfolio of online real estate properties. Um, and they had this challenge where they had to analyze uh, data regarding 100 million homes, and they had to very quickly use machine learning to work out uh, the Zestimate. They're, they're famous for being able to work out a, a real market value estimate for um, all the properties that are in their database. And so Zillow built out on AWS this um, pipeline where they take data from multiple sources, <clears throat> so public property records, home tax assessments, all types of different data sources. They bring that in through Kinesis into Amazon S3, into the data lake, and then they use Spark on EMR to run these machine learning jobs um, to, to analyze and then uh, work out estimates um, for, for that. So another type of um, analysis that you may need to do may involve data warehouses, and, and this is where you have um, business analysts that are, that are looking to say, you know, we want to load f the really frequently queried data into a high-speed data warehouse, um, and this is generally for dashboards and, and other type of operational reporting. And so Amazon Redshift is a uh, fast and, and simple to configure and deploy and manage data warehouse um, that, as you'll see in a moment, can also extend your queries um, to the data lake. So quick side here, I felt I had to put this in because this is quite often a, uh, a question that comes up where people say, so let me get it, data lakes have now replaced data warehouses, um, or I have to choose a data lake or a data warehouse. And, and that's uh, absolutely not the case. Um, data lakes are complementary um, to data warehouses. And um, often, oftentimes, a data lake is a source of data for the data warehouse. And there's a few other things in this table. I'm not going to go through, through them all now. Um, but you, you can see this table is kind of a, a good quick highlight of some of the differences where things like with the data lake, it's schema and read. So it's really optimized for quick ingestion. Just, just bring your data in. Um, when we read it, we'll, we'll, use, uh, we'll project a schema onto it where with the data warehouse, you've really got to put a lot of thought up front into exactly how you're going to structure your schema, and then it's, it's really pretty fixed, um, and ingesting data is, is a relatively um, expensive operation. And then data lakes are for data scientists and analysts and, and multiple use cases where data warehouses really excel at business intelligence reporting, but, but that, is, that is what they do. And data warehouses are SQL um, queries. That's what you use with the data warehouse. With the data lake, you can use things like Hadoop and, uh, and Hive and, and Spark um, for, for your analytics. So with Warehouse, with, with Redshift, you get a data warehouse that you can deploy within a matter of minutes. Um, you can specify the size that you want your, uh, your cluster to be. And if you've ever dealt with data warehouses um, on-prem, uh, you'll see that the cost of Redshift comparatively is, is very low. And then a few years ago, we announced Rich of Spectrum, which really extends your data warehouse to the data lake. And so a common pattern here is where you will load maybe the last three months of sales data into your data warehouse because you know that the business queries data on a quarterly basis. And so the last three months of data is, is constantly being queried by thousands of users throughout the business and business analysts. And they really need the top performance from those queries. And they need to be able to do queries um, at scale and, and all the time. Um, but occasionally, they may need one of those queries. They may need some data that's in the data lake. That's maybe from an unrelated data set or maybe some archive data. So it's not something they're querying all the time, but it would be really useful if they could access that. And to load all this data that every data analyst may want into the data warehouse, will become a, a relatively cost, costly um, process. And so what you do with um, Amazon Redshift Spectrum, you're able to define um, those tables that you have in your data lake that have been discovered by Glue, so they're registered in the Glue catalog. Um, Amazon Redshift Spectrum is able to use those as external tables. And you can join those external tables with the internal tables that have been loaded into the data warehouse. So it looks a little bit like this, where again, you've got your data lake at the bottom. You use copy commands to copy data from S3 
into the um, Redshift cluster. Over here, we've got a, a three-node cluster. Um, and so those clusters all have high-performance SSD disk, and you, you're doing all your hot data queries on that. And then every now and then, when you need to get some archive data or another data source in S3 for, for the occasional query, um, Redshift Spectrum will go out, and it will use a bunch of warm compute power that, that we have available, and we will run that query and then pass it back uh, to the, the Redshift nodes so that they can consolidate the queries. And then uh, at the top there, you have the leader node, uh, which then presents is, or manages that interface uh, between the reporting tools or whatever you're using to make your JDBC connection um, and, and Redshift. So a great example here is, is one uh, close to home here with Amazon.com. Uh, we had 50 petabytes of data, and we had 600,000 analytic jobs a day. And uh, we really found that we were hitting uh, the limits of our traditional Oracle data warehouse. Um, we found it was really expensive, it was difficult to maintain, it took a lot of man hours to, to keep uh, that up and running. And we were getting to the point that it was becoming really difficult to scale it. So, and so we set out on this process to move to a new architecture using an S3 data lake and then using Redshift, Redshift Spectrum, and EMR. And I believe it was uh, November last year that we fully moved um, of all of our Oracle data warehouses. And we've now been able to double the amount of data stored to 100 petabytes. We've lowered uh, the cost of running the analytics um, and able to gain new insights through the power of having um, both Redshift and Redshift Spectrum and making that available to, to the business analysts. And then the, the last uh, service I, I want to talk about is um, Amazon QuickSight. And QuickSight really is a fast cloud-based business intelligence service. So if you've worked before in the past with products like Tableau um, and Click and some of those, um, QuickSight is our business intelligence platform. And so this is generally used by business analysts who want to be able to create rich visualizations from your data to gain new insights and then be able to very easily share those around the organization. So a couple of things to point out that make um, QuickSight different to some of the other BI tools out there. First is that it's purely cloud-based. It's, it's serverless. Um, so there's no server to go and deploy. There's no EC2 instances to manage. Um, and you'll get to, in the, in the next labs that we do, you're going to log into QuickSight, and, and you'll, you'll get some hands-on experience with that. And then it's, it's scalable. You can start doing some queries today. And actually, you always get one free user per AWS account for QuickSight, so there's no charge for the first user. And then you may expand to, to 10 users next week, and, and maybe you expand to 1,000 users in a couple of months. And we scale it all behind the scenes for you. So it's, it's, there's nothing to manage here. It's all managed um, behind the scenes. And then again, along with, uh, you, you'll, if you know Amazon and AWS, you'll know our, our pricing philosophy. We want you to pay for what you use. And so as you derive value from our services, um, you, you pay for those. And so you can actually have users that if they don't log into QuickSight and don't run um, any, they don't do, uh, look at any of the dashboards or, or run anything, you're not going to pay anything for them for the month when they don't do anything. And if they log in once a week to have a look at a dashboard, there's a per session price um, that, that is charged for that. So it's an incredibly low cost tool that you can really make available to wide groups of users within an organization uh, because you're only paying as they use and, and actually uh, work with QuickSight. And then QuickSight, again, um, is, is able to work with the tools we've spoken about, Athena and Redshift um, and EMR. Um, but QuickSight is also able to connect to a bunch of other data sources. That includes data sources that may be on-prem, so as long as you've got the networking access set up right, you can use QuickSight to analyze data from um, on-prem databases. Um, there's a, a bunch of tools here, our RDS, which is our managed relational database service. QuickSight can integrate with that. And then also with a bunch of third-party applications, so things like Salesforce and Square and Adobe Analytics. So there's a wide variety of data sources that you can bring together for your business analysts so that they can um, look for new insights. 
And so this is really what QuickSight is good at. It's being able to create and then publish and share interactive dashboards. So you can have a business analyst that takes data sources from various places, brings them together, um, creates the basic dashboard, and then gives uh, business users access. And when they log in, they can further filter the data. They can drill down into the data as well. And so they can, it's not just a static dashboard. They're able to interact um, with, with the data visualization. <clears throat> You're even able to take the dashboards that are developed and actually embed them in your own application. So you can have possibly external users to your organization. You don't want to give them direct QuickSight access. Um, you can embed a QuickSight visualization um, through iframes into an application that you've written. And an example here is the NFL. So they have a bunch of stats that they make available to the teams through their application or through their website. Um, these teams wouldn't even know that they were using QuickSight under the covers, but they're able to log in, they, they get the data, the visualizations, they can interact again, drill down and filter the data. Um, and in the back end, it's using QuickSight, but it's presented as a cohesive part of um, your application. And uh, another example of a customer here is, is Rio Tinto. They're the world's largest materials and, and uh, mining company. Um, and they've got uh, 20,000 users for their critical risk management CRM system. Um, and they're a big user of QuickSight um, to enable those users to very easily explore uh, large data th sets with um, thousands of data points. So I knew we wouldn't have much time, so I'm not really going to go very deep into this, but it would be wrong if we were speaking about data lakes and we're speaking about analytics if we didn't at least talk uh, briefly about machine learning and, and all the use cases that um, are coming out for machine learning now. And so at AWS, we've taken this approach where we've got effectively three different layers of machine learning that are often targeted at different um, people within an organization. <clears throat> so you may have um, data scientists, the, the guys that have gone and been working with machine, machine learning models for years and have a PhD in machine learning. Uh, those types of people are often wanting to really kind of get down um, to the core, and they will use something like our deep learning uh, AMI, our Amazon machine image. They will boot that up on a EC2 virtual machine, and that comes pre-compiled with all of these different frameworks like MXNet and TensorFlow and a bunch of others. So we pre-compile and manage that, put it together, and so you'll have your data scientists at some level may want to work at, at that uh, level. But we find um, our, our goal here really is to make machine learning available to a much wider variety of developers, not just the, the people that have, have been studying it for years and have got their PhDs. Um, and so we've got services in the middle there, the platform there, things like Amazon SageMaker. And this is a service that makes it much easier to use pre-built algorithms or develop your own. Um, it makes it easier to train with the data that's in S3, to train your models, to tune the models, and then ultimately to deploy the model to a hosted SageMaker um, environment so that you can run predictions or inference against those models. And then at the top, we've got um, the AI services. And this is where we've taken a model, we've developed it and trained it, and we don't stop once we release the service. We keep developing it and training it and improving it. But you've got a bunch of services here for things like Amazon recognition. And so the example I gave earlier of the realty company getting all of these um, <clears throat> pictures from the agents of, of the houses, they can use things like recognition to identify, is there a pool in this picture? Is this a kitchen? Is this the bathroom? Um, or you can imagine in a, in a dating application, you can do facial recognition to see, is somebody happy? Are they sad? Um, so th there's all types of metadata that you can now use. Uh, you can pull out of images using machine learning. And we make that available with something like Amazon recognition. We've, we've got other services like Amazon Transcribe. And this way, you can take an audio file, such as recordings um, of meetings or uh, from your contact center. Uh, you can take these audio files, run it uh, through Transcribe, and you will get a transcript of um, the, the dialogue in that meeting. And then you can use something like Amazon Comprehend 
to, to gain insight into what their text is telling you. Was this a positive conversation? What were the key entities uh, that were discussed? Um, and so on. And so as you bring all these different data sources into the centralized S3 data lake, uh, you, you really are enabled with um, a large amount of, uh, you, you can really solve a bunch of use cases um, using the wide variety of tools that are available uh, within the ecosystem built around S3. So I see we do still have five minutes left, so let's take a couple of questions. So the question was, do we have ML models um, built within Athena at this time? We I don't think we do. No. Okay, so if, if I'm understanding and, and remembering, because there were two questions there, I think the one was how we talk about the decoupling of storage and compute, and then how does Redshift fit into that? Are we saying, you know, don't use Redshift because now with Redshift, your storage and your compute is, is coupled? And, and I would say, again, um, there, there are trade-offs and there are different workloads, and you should look at what tool you need uh, for, for each workload. Also remember with Redshift, because of Redshift Spectrum, the coupling between compute and storage is not as tight. So for the data that you're querying um, on a very frequent basis, um, and you really need high performance that you're not going to be able to get in the same way from S3. You need maybe sub-second sub performance on large data queries. You really need kind of SSD disk close to the compute um, to be able to do that. So there are workloads where Redshift makes sense, and you are going to very likely have a bunch of Redshift clusters, um, and you can extend that. So the idea here really is just you want to put the right data in Redshift, and that's data that you need fast, um, extremely fast query performance on, and data that is queried frequently. If it's not queried that frequently, it should probably be in the data lake, and you should use Redshift Spectrum to extend your queries uh, to that, or, or you should um, use Athena for that um, alternatively as well. Um, and I think you were asking a question about how Athena integrates with things like Spark, um, ML, and that. So when you're using something like EMR that has a, a Spark engine built into it, that won't use Athena to query the data in S3. EMR has got its own integration with the Glue catalog that makes the data in S3 available um, to Spark. So yeah, they're, they're different use cases there. Yeah, and I mean, I just want to add that you, EM, uh, so SageMaker integrates with EMR as well. So you can run SageMaker with EMR. SageMaker also integrates with a, a, a Spark endpoint that Glue provides if you want to use a serverless Spark endpoint. So you can run SageMaker or your own Zeppelin notebook and connect it to the uh, dev endpoints in Glue, which are essentially just a Spark endpoint. Okay, I think we've got one, uh, we've got two minutes. So let's see how quick this question is. So, I mean, uh, the, the question was about um, S3 being eventually consistent storage, and how does that work with, with EMR and um, transient data? If I'm understanding correctly, so often what you'll do is you may um, load some data from S3 into your cluster, into an HDFS file system running in the cluster that you use as transient storage while the job runs, and then at the end of the job, you will um, offload that again to the persistent data store, which is S3. 
Um, EMR also has EMRFS, which actually helps with the consistency, consistency issues on S3. So if you have EMRFS enabled and you're writing to S3, you should not see the consistency. So, so and we're just going to quickly uh, wrap up our Twitch broadcast here. We've kind of reached up the hour for that. Um, so thank you to everybody from Twitch who, who joined for this um, as well. Um, but we'll, we'll take a couple of more questions after this. Thank you.